Good morning, Doug Munson here. Welcome to the online service for July 26, 2020. A few announcements this morning. There'll be an evening service tonight at 6 p.m. The book of James is being steadied still. Next Sunday then, August 2nd, Communion Sunday. So please prepare yourselves and the elements to partake in the Lord's Supper. Now reading today from the Psalms, chapter 46, verse 6 to 11. The heathen raged, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he has made in the earth. He makes wars to cease. Unto the end of the earth, he breaks the bow, cuts the spear in sunder, burns the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Let's pray. Father, we're reminded that you are our help in all generations. And what a generation we're living in. But nothing surprises you, for you see through all time. And so in this time, help us, we pray, to be still, to know you better, walk in the freedom that you have bought for us. It's never easy, but your spirit helps us as we ask. Grant Pastor Josh your anointing on the word today. Give him the freedom that it may speak to the hearts of the people. I ask for Jesus' sake. Amen.
Good morning, kids. If you know me very well, you'll know that I like fire. And we actually use fire all the time in our day-to-day -day life. We cook our food with it. We heat our houses with it. We even put birthday candles on our cakes to add to the celebratory nature. Hopefully your birthday candle's not this big, otherwise your cake will end up with wax all over. But this is the one I had. What's fascinating about candles is they're so simple. They're made up of two things. They're made up of, of wax, and they're made up of a wick. And you put those two things and you have a candle. And then all you have to do is you take fire and you light it. But if you don't do it right, if you don't combine those parts correctly, you don't end up with anything, really. For instance, I can take a wick, and I can light it on fire, hopefully. There we go. And it'll burn nice and bright. We got a nice big flame, but can you see what's wrong with that already? It's going to burn out in no time at all. It's not going to give light, and it's done. Or you take the wax. This is beeswax for making candles. And you can make it into something that looks kind of like a candle. You know, it's cylindrical, but it has no wick. And if I take this, and I take my lighter, and I try to light it on fire, you know what happens? Nothing. You don't get any fire. You just end up with a big, melted, waxy mess. And even if you have the candle, you've put the wick in it, you have the wax on it, but you never set flame to it, you don't have a, a candle that's giving light, you just have a decoration. It's amazing that something so simple still requires all the parts to be working together. And in our walk with God, I see some of the same things. We need to live out our faith, and we do that by taking action, and these actions need to be done in love. And we've been looking at the book of Galatians, and over and over and over again, Paul's been reminding the church in Galatia that they can't earn their salvation, that we don't become saved by doing religious works. In our passage today, Paul reminds them of that yet again. In chapter 5, verse 6, he says, for in Christ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. And that reminds me of the candle. Faith has to be lived out. If you jump over to James, that author really fleshes out that idea that faith without deeds, faith that's not lived out, is dead. Just like a candle that sits on the bookshelf and is never, never used, never had flame put to it, is wasted. But just like you can take the wax and light it on fire without the wick, you just end up with a mess. So the, if we have faith and we live it out, but it's, the deeds aren't done in a loving fashion, it's not very beneficial either. Rather, what Paul says is faith expressed in love is what counts. That's what matters. And when we do these things, when we live out our faith, and we do so in a way that's loving to others and loving towards God, our lives become like a candle that burns brightly for Him. Galatians 5, 1 to 12. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. For though the Spirit e for we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. You ran well, who hindered you from obeying the truth. This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will have no other mind, but he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. 
And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. I wish, I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. Well, at this time, we have the great privilege of coming to the Lord in prayer. And so we're going to be praying for a few things. The family of the week are Mark and Ann. And the missionary of the week are the Garrickies in Romania. And then we are praying for the communities of Westera and Genesis on the lake and Stony Plain. So please join with me as we pray. Lord Jesus, we just want to thank you so much for this incredible privilege that you have given us to pray. It is indeed an honor, Lord, that we can come to you, to your throne of grace, knowing that you hear our prayers and we know that when you hear, you answer according to your will and for your glory. We want to thank you for Mark and Ann, Lord, and just their, their commitment to Parkland Baptist. And I just pray, Lord, that this week that they would sense your blessing in a special way, your favor throughout the week. It says in your word that your loving kindness is new every morning. May they just experience a new aspect of your love throughout this week. Be with Mark, Lord, as he is experiencing an increased amount of workload and at his job and that you would give him the strength to persevere and the wisdom, Lord, to, to work well. And Anne as well in her work, Lord, that you would strengthen her and that they would sense your presence, Lord, individually and as a couple. Lord, we thank you for the Giriki family, Lord, and their ministry in Romania. Lord, we just ask that this week would prove to be a special week for them, that whatever challenges they're facing, Lord, that you would flatten them, whatever obstacles that may be in the way, that you would clear, clear those obstacles, Lord, and that you would enlarge their ministry and increase their fruitfulness. Lord, that you would just continue to give them the stamina that they need, that your Holy Spirit would empower them, and Lord, I don't know if they're having camps or how things are going with the COVID, but I just pray, Lord, that whatever uh, activities are happening, Lord, that to be much fruit for you, that you would be glorified in their ministry and in this camp. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to pray for various communities. And Lord, that we know that your word goes forth. And so, Lord, we just ask that the communities of West Terra and Genesis on the Lake and in, in Stony Plain, Lord, that they would have opportunity, that the families and homes in those two communities would have opportunity to hear the message of the gospel, however you choose, whether through friends or family or work, online, however. We just pray, Lord, that your word would go forth and that they would have opportunity to hear the gospel message and that your spirit would bring conviction of sin and convincing them of their need for your righteousness. Lord, we want to pray for our governing authorities. And Lord, they got a lot of decisions to make. And even the, the conservative party, Lord, in choosing a leader. Uh, Lord, we just pray that your will be done in all these matters. Lord, we ask that as decisions are being made at the local level, at the provincial level, at the federal level, regarding uh, this pandemic and everything associated with it, Lord, that you would give wisdom. And Lord Jesus, that uh, you would channel their hearts according to your will. Lord, we do pray that you would cause this pandemic to subside and recede and diminish and that even here in this region, the Parkland County and in this province and across this country, Lord, that there would be fewer and fewer cases of COVID and and even fewer and fewer casualties. Thank you that nothing is too difficult for you. And Lord, we commit the, the remainder of this time to you and the message that I'm about to give, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would anoint my lips to be able to speak your word, that your grace would pour forth through my lips as I declare your word. Lord, that your word would not return to you empty, but accomplish the purpose for which you sent it, that your people would be instructed, equipped, edified, and encouraged. And Lord, if there are those that don't know you in personal relationship, that you would use this message to draw them to yourself. Lord, whatever is not of you, I pray it doesn't bear fruit in our lives. But Lord, those words, those utterances that are from you, that they would bear fruit in our lives. 
And so we ask, Lord Jesus, that you would hear our prayers and you would answer them and that you would be glorified in answering them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In her song, Me and Bobby McGee, Janis Joplin, a famous female vocalist back in the 60s, said that freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. Well, is that really freedom? Are we free to do whatever we want? Is freedom an excuse to indulge ourselves? Well, we're going to kind of talk about that in the passage we're looking at today in Galatians chapter 5. And what we're going to find is that freedom is only possible by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. And so turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. Let's look at verse 1. We'll work our way through the text until verse 12. It says, It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Now, according to Scripture, freedom means that our former master, whoever or whatever it may be, no longer has authority over us. So as Christians, for example, sin, Satan, and death are no longer masters. Of course, we experience sin and we experience the oppression of the Satan and we all experience death, but we are not enslaved to these things. And furthermore, we're also free from the burden of trying to be good enough for God through our good works and religious customs. In John chapter 8, Verse 36, Jesus says to the Pharisees who were saying that they are not enslaved to anyone, Jesus said, so if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. And so ultimately we are set free from bondage to sin, from bondage to Satan, and from even death by Christ Jesus. But freedom has many opponents, and our freedom in Christ is constantly challenged, and so freedom must be protected. Freedom must be defended. And how do we safeguard freedom? Well, it tells us here in verse 1, by standing firm. Just as a deeply rooted tree can stand firm in a raging storm, so we can stand secure in our freedom by being firmly rooted in the grace of God. But if we rely on something or on someone other than grace to maintain our freedom, well, I believe we'll find ourselves enslaved once again by a new master called legalism. For example, if we go to uh, Leviticus chapter 26, Leviticus chapter 26, verse 13, kind of lost my little... Marker there, so taking a little bit of time to get there. Leviticus 26, verse 13, it says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt so that you would not be their slaves. And I broke the bars of your yoke and made you walk erect. And notice how they can walk erect. They can stand firm. They can stand upright because they were free. But once we're in bondage, we can no longer stand upright in the spiritual sense. We can no longer stand firm. And as we saw in a, f- in a previous message in, in Galatians, false teachers who had infiltrated the congregations there in Galatia tried to convince the Galatian believers that in order to partake of the blessing of Abraham, in order to remain in good standing with God, they had to believe in Jesus and assume Jewish identity by yielding to circumcision. But forcing Gentiles to live as Jews is contrary to freedom. And so this is why in verse 2 it says, Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. Now Paul is not against a Jewish believer being circumcised as part of their Jewish identity and lifestyle. For example, Timothy had Timothy, who was Jewish, 
circumcised. But what he is against, he's against forcing Gentile believers to assume Jewish identity as a requirement for staying right with God. And this, for example, is the reason why he didn't have Titus circumcised. He was a Gentile. Now, receiving circumcision for health reasons and for a hygienic benefit is not the issue. The issue is to be circumcised for religious reasons. And so Paul is saying that submitting to circumcision in this way is to acknowledge that law-keeping is necessary to maintain a right standing with God. And this belief would negate the grace of God. Well, what about today? What does circumcision symbolize today? for us 21st century Christians. Well, I believe circumcision is a symbol of legalism. It represents a system of earning our way into heaven by good works and religious customs. And if we accept a Christianity based on human merit, we are claiming that the finished work of Christ Jesus is not enough. We are saying our Christian practices, our good deeds, completes what Jesus accomplished. For example, if I follow a system based on human merit, if I follow a religion that combines the work of Jesus with my good works, what do I get in the end? Well, I get not a relationship with Jesus, but rather a lifeless religion. And so if we insist on adding our good works to merit God's righteousness, Jesus will be of no help to us. It says here, Christ will be of no benefit to you. Adding our own righteousness to his puts a wedge between the Lord and us. Legalism makes light the finished work of Christ Jesus. It diminishes the work that Jesus accomplished. But as we trust in the Lord, we find he supplies all the needed resources we need in regard to our salvation and service. And then in verse 3, he says this, he says, And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. You see, the message of the false teachers, as I mentioned, was that by receiving circumcision, the Galatian believers would be more blessed. But in truth, Paul warned that circumcision carried the obligation to obey the whole law, all 613 commands. And the option of, of picking and choosing what law we want to obey is not there. We can't look at the law and say, hmm, I like this one. I think I'll keep it. But that law, well, no, I don't like it so much, so I'm going to ignore it. No, the, the Mosaic law is not like a buffet where we can pick and choose what we want to eat. And so what Paul is saying here is that if we want to live by law, if we want to establish personal merit before God, we can't choose which laws we want to obey. For example, in, in James chapter 2, verse 10. <clears throat> here James is saying this. James chapter 2, verse 10 says, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. It comes as one package unit, and if we break one law, we're guilty of breaking it all. For example, if I surpass the, the speed limit and get pulled over by an officer, I don't say, please, officer, can you give me a break? I haven't robbed anyone. I haven't murdered anybody. I don't commit adultery. Well, you know what? The laws I keep do not cover the laws I break. So no amount of obedience can make up for one act of disobedience, and this is why... We do not want to submit to a religious system that adds our righteousness to the righteousness of Christ Jesus as a way to merit God's favor. We don't want to go there. Because when we submit to such a way of, to such a way of life, when we seek to establish personal merit before the Lord, it is then that we cease to be free. We are enslaved all over again. So the question then is, why do Christians become legalistic? What is attractive about a legalistic Christianity? Why would we fall into the trap of seeking to establish our own righteousness? Well, I believe it's because we don't, we don't believe... No, sorry. It's because if we don't have rules and regulations to keep us in line, we will end up as rebels. But the Bible teaches 
that no person becomes a rebel when relying on God's grace and yielding to his spirit. For example, this is one of the, my favorite verses regarding the grace of God. It's found in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. It says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness. This is what grace does. It instructs us. It teaches us to say no to sin and to worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. That doesn't sound like a rebellious lifestyle. That sounds like the type of lifestyle the Lord has called us to. And so grace does not lead us into rebellion. And therefore we don't need external rules and regulations to keep us in line. And then in verse 4 of chapter 5 it says this. You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. This is pretty serious. The result of defecting from the gospel of grace for a system of personal righteousness is described here in the most alarming way. Severed from Christ, fallen from grace. What Paul is telling us here is that if we seek to establish our own righteousness, we will cut ourselves off from the Lord Jesus. His righteousness will be of no value to us. And so by adding our good works to merit God's favor, we cease to be free. By adding our good works to merit God's favor, we sever ourselves from the Lord Jesus. And by adding our good works to merit God's favor, we separate ourselves from His grace. We have fallen from grace. Now, Christians can fall away from grace, as it says here, but it's not because of committing some gross immoral sin. Fallen from grace means that our trust in Christ Jesus is forfeited for a merit-based system. We lose our grip on grace for daily living. Grace no longer operates in our salvation reality. Now before we talk about falling from grace, let's talk a little bit about how we enter into this grace. Now Romans chapter 5 uh, verse 2 says this. It says, through whom we have also obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And so we enter into this sphere of grace by faith, which suggests that we can also exit from the sphere of grace, and that's what I think Paul is getting at. And so one who says, I was saved by grace through faith, in Christ Jesus, but now my salvation depends upon my own efforts. Anyone who lives according to this philosophy has fallen out of the sphere of God's grace and say no longer rely on His grace to persevere. Our relationship with the Lord is either by divine accomplishment or by human achievement. It cannot be a picture of both. Or it cannot be a mixture of both, sorry. So does falling from grace suggest that we lose our salvation? Is that what Paul is saying here? Well, I don't believe so. And the reason for that is because if we go to earlier chapters in Galatians, for example, in Galatians 4.12, Paul calls the Galatian believers brothers. If they're brothers in the Lord, it means that they believe in the same Jesus. So what is he getting at? Falling from grace, what does that suggest? Well, I think if we view salvation as past, present, and future, we may understand a little bit of what Paul is getting at. See, salvation is in the past tense, the present tense, and the future tense. We are justified by grace through faith. That is past. That happens at the point where we, we trust in the Lord Jesus for our salvation. We are justified at a particular point in time. And we're being sanctified by grace through faith. That is the present. That's what happens between the time we accept the Lord Jesus until the time we die. That's the whole process of sanctification. And finally, we are glorified by grace through faith, and that is yet future. I believe Paul is saying that we can fall out of the sphere of God's grace for sanctification. If we seek to establish our own righteousness, we no longer grow in sanctifying grace. When we fall from grace, we are still justified by faith, but we cease to grow and mature in the grace of God. For example, 
Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Peter says this, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now when he says that, it, it suggests that we, there is a possibility of not being able to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus. And that's what I think it means by falling from grace, by ceasing to grow in sanctifying grace. And so what Paul is telling us here in Galatians chapter 5 is we continue our Christian life the same way we began our Christian life, by grace through faith. The Lord lavishes His grace on us not because of our feats for Him. He lavishes His grace on us because of our faith in Him. And so through faith in Christ Jesus, we stand firm in our freedom. Through faith in Christ Jesus, we stay connected to the Lord. Through faith in Christ Jesus, we remain within the sphere of God's sanctifying grace. And because we have the inward power of the Spirit dwelling in us, we do not need the outward force of rules and regulations. The indwelling Spirit does a far better job bringing about righteousness than our good works and religious customs can ever do. And then in verse 5 he says this, For we, through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. Now just as a zygote or an embryo or a fetus is fully human, though not fully developed, in the same way, we are righteous, but not fully righteous. When we are glorified at the resurrection, at that point we receive the full and final measure of divine righteousness And this is what I believe Paul is getting at with the hope of righteousness. The hope of final, complete righteousness, which happens at the resurrection. And then in verse 6 says, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. So he's saying here that circumcision or uncircumcision has no role in attaining the hope of of righteousness. What is of value is faith working through love. And just as faith waits for the hope of righteousness, as we saw in verse 4, faith also works through love. And so here in these two verses, in verses uh, 5 and 6, we find the hallmarks of a justified believer. Faith, hope, and love. And the order of faith and love is important. Faith is the root And love is the fruit. Faith produces the work, but the work does not produce faith. And so faith working through love fulfills the law far better than our self-righteousness. And so through faith in Christ Jesus, we stand firm in our freedom. We stay connected to the Lord. We remain within the sphere of God's sanctifying grace. Through faith in Christ Jesus, we wait for the hope of the resurrection as we work out the love of God. And then in verse 7 and 8, it says this, You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion did not come from him who calls you. Scripture likens the Christian life to a race, and we don't run the race to be saved. We run the race because we are already saved. But legalism hinders our progress in the race. It restricts our walk with the Lord. It obstructs our status as free people. And we will always face challenges that seek to hinder our progress in the Lord. We will always face obstacles that that attempt to turn our race from a spirit-empowered one to a self-sustaining one. And the only line, or sorry, the only lane we are to run in is the lane of grace, the lane called grace. The only strength we are to expend is the power the Spirit supplies. And anything that hinders our progress, anything that obstructs our service, anything that restricts our freedom has nothing to do with God's will or purposes and must be rejected. This is what he means, that this persuasion did not come from him who calls you. The Lord is not the one who's causing them to be hindered in their race. And in verse 9 and 10, it says this, A little leaven 
leavens the whole lump of dough. I have confidence in you and the Lord that you will adopt no other view, but the one who is disturbing you will bear this judgment, whoever he is. You know, I've heard the saying, we may have heard the saying, great oaks from little acorns grow. Start small, and then it grows into a big, solid, massive tree. Well, in the same way, a little yeast goes a long way. And in Scripture, yeast is a symbol of sin and lies. For example, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 6, here Jesus is referring to the Pharisees, and he points out their hypocrisy. In Matthew chapter 6, 16, verse 6, <clears throat> notice what Jesus said here. He says, Watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. He's referring to the legalistic tendencies that they were propagating. Now, before the Exodus, Israel had to bake bread without yeast so that they would not be delayed in leaving a life of slavery for freedom. They couldn't wait for the dough to rise. They had to leave in haste. And so they baked their bread without yeast because leaven, yeast, delays us in the race we are running. It slows us down. Sin and false could slow us down in our walk with the Lord, hinder us, obstruct us, obstruct our, our walk and our progress. And if not dealt with, false teaching, which might begin small, will quickly spread and disturb a whole local church congregation as it was doing here in this case. And so in verse 11 and 12, and we'll finish with this, it says, But I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. I wish that those who are troubling you would even mutilate themselves. And some people walk away from the church because they are offended by the exclusive claims of the gospel. The cross provokes persecution. The cross arouses opposition. So why is the cross so offensive? Because it nullifies any thought of personal merit. The cross says God will not accept my righteousness as the basis of justification. The cross is offensive because it says good people do not make it to heaven on their own. For example, Nicodemus in John chapter 3. A very, very moral man. If anyone could earn his way to heaven, it should be Nicodemus. And Jesus tells him, unless you're born again, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. So the cross is offensive because it says good moral people do not make it to heaven on their own. The cross crushes our pride. It says I must die to self. The cross is offensive because it is God's final no to all human attempts to seek and serve God. The cross is offensive not because Jesus died for my sins. In fact, that's probably the aspect of the cross that, that we all embrace. The offense of the cross, though, is that I must die with him. For example, in the next chapter, no, not, sorry, not the next chapter, in the same chapter, a few verses down in verse 24, notice what it says. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. That's why the cross is offensive, because I must die to self. And so in conclusion, the doctrine of grace is not a dangerous doctrine. It is religious legalism that is the dangerous doctrine because it is guaranteed to fail. But why is legalism so attractive? Well, because we don't believe God's grace is enough. And so we add a few good works to be on the safe side. Why is the cross so offensive? Because it puts an end to my pride. And why is faith so necessary? <clears throat> Excuse me, because through faith in Christ Jesus, we stand firm in our freedom. We stay connected to the Lord and we remain within the sphere of God's sanctifying grace. Faith is important because through faith in Christ Jesus, we wait for the future hope of righteousness as we presently work out the love of God. And so our salvation continues in the same way it began by grace alone, through faith alone, 
in Christ Jesus alone. So please, please do not attempt to establish your own righteousness and sever yourselves from the Lord Jesus and fall from his grace. Instead, exercise faith in him. Why don't we just pray? Lord, we thank you so much that you've given us open access into your grace. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that your grace is more than sufficient. We don't need to rely on our own efforts. We don't need to rely on re religious rituals. We don't need to rely on our good works to merit your favor. The Lord Jesus has done all of that on our behalf. And so, Lord, help us not to be looking to ourselves to continue on in this relationship with you, but let us continue to look to you. Just as we began our relationship with you on the basis of faith, help us, Lord, to continue this relationship with you on the basis of faith. Because your grace is sufficient to keep us saved. Your grace teaches us to say no to sin. <clears throat> your grace teaches us to say yes to your righteousness. And Lord, if there's people that are listening, anyone listening here that doesn't know you in personal relationship, that has not experienced your grace, Lord, I pray that you would draw them to yourself so that they can know the lavish, infinite grace of Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the salvation that you've given to us and that you've secured it from beginning to end. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I've mentioned several times at this time when we have our benediction that, you know, that we are saved to inherit a blessing. That is why the Lord died on the cross and rose again so that you and I can inherit a blessing. And the blessing that we can inherit is the blessing that's found in Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 to 26. And so as I read this passage, as I read out this blessing, I want you to receive this blessing as from the Lord, knowing 
that it is, is His will to bless you. And so the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance on you and give you His peace. And so may you go in the grace, in the favor, in the blessing, and in the shalom of God, not only today, but in this week. In the name of Christ Jesus, amen.